Okay, I think we can get started. Um, good evening, everyone. My name is Michelle Sanford, and I'm the Public Relations and Community Benefits Manager for Milford Regional Medical Center. It's my pleasure to welcome you all to our program tonight. Just a few things to note. Um, the webinar is being recorded. The raise hand function will be disabled, and there will be a question and answer portion at the end of the webinar. You can type in your question at any time through the Q&A icon on the bottom of your screen, and we'll try to get to as many questions as we can tonight. This evening, Milford Regional's Community Benefits Programming brings you opening doors to youth mental health that will feature medical and mental health professionals who will focus on the early signs of ADHD, depression, and anxiety, while also recognizing what typical developing behaviors are. One of the priorities for the Community Benefits Committee is mental health, and through the committee's leadership and local partnerships, members continue to develop initiatives like this one tonight to help with this crisis. In October of 2022, the committee sponsored its first panel at discussion at the hospital on clinical and community solutions to address youth mental health. Due to the success of that event, a second panel discussion was held focusing on the need for more home-based mental health services. Tonight's program marks the Community Benefits Committee's third event on youth mental health. Now I'd like to introduce tonight's moderator, Milford Regional Vice President and Chief Quality Officer, Bert Thurlow Walsh. In his role at Milford Regional, Bert is responsible for the management and oversight of the Division of Quality and Patient Safety, which includes risk claims management, accreditation, patient relations, infection control, interpreter services, care coordination, pharmacy, behavioral health, and organiz organizational excellence. Bert has more than 30 years experience in healthcare with a focus on quality and patient safety and has previously held leadership roles at Newton Wellesley Hospital and St. Elizabeth's Medical Center, as well as Mount Sinai Medical Center in Miami. Bert has two bachelor's degrees, one in natural science and mathematics and the other in nursing and holds a master's in healthcare management and is a certified professional in healthcare quality. It's now my pleasure to hand over the webinar to Bert. Thank you, Michelle, for that very kind introduction. On behalf of Milford Regional Medical Center, good evening and welcome to our, all our participants and panelists. Mental Health America developed a Youth 2023 report utilizing data from the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration's Center for Behavioral Health Statistics and Quality. In the report, the authors showed youth that reported at least one major depressive disorder episode was 16.39% nationally. In Massachusetts, that rate is a little higher at 17.74%. 59.8% of youth with major depression did not receive any mental health treatment. And the report also revealed that one in 10 youth covered under private insurance do not have coverage for mental or emotional difficulties, according accounting for greater than 1.2 million youth with inadequate or no coverage. Additionally, the youth mental health crisis was recently highlighted in the October 19th edition of the U.S. News and World Report titled, The Youth Mental Health Emergency Isn't Over. Government Must Act Now. The article cited from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention's 2021 data that nearly 60% of teen girls recently experienced persistent sadness or hopelessness, and nearly one third of high school girls considered suicide. The article continued, if we are to support all youth mental health, we need to start doing so earlier in their lives. And most notably in the article, they cited Congress needs to focus on pro programmatic development and funding, specifically on prevention and early intervention. Milford Regional Medical Center locally has focused over the last two years on best practices and approaches to managing youth mental health crisis in the community with panels, as Michelle had noted in her opening, for mental health professionals, schools, police, and other professionals in the area. Tonight is the third panel discussion conducted by Milford Regional and our amazing colleagues in the community with the caregivers and parents as the primary focus. This stated, it is my ultimate pleasure to provide you with the brief bios on our three amazing speakers. 
Our first speaker this evening on the panel will be Dr. Mary Lyons. For the last 24 years, she has worked as a pediatrician for Milford Regional Physician Group, serving as the Physician Director of Pediatrics since 2010. Prior to that, she served as the Director of the Teen Taught Clinic at for South Boston Community Health Center. Dr. Lyons practices at the Franklin Pediatric and Adolescent Care. Our second panelist is a licensed mental health clinician who has been in the field since 2006, Kate Rose. She received her undergraduate degree in psychology from NYU and her graduate degree in counseling psychology from Framingham State University. Kate began her career working in residential treatment settings and in the juvenile justice field as both a clinician and clinical director for the Department of Youth Services. For the past 12 years, she has been a supervisor at Family Continuity Programs in Wittensville. Most recently, Kate has opened an adolescent drop-in center aimed at reducing substance use and building pro-social activities. She has worked with integrated care, GL diversion work, and carries an outpatient caseload as well as both children, adolescents, and adults. Our third and final, final panelist will be Destiny O'Connell. Destiny received her bachelor's degree in psychology with a minor in criminology from Framingham State University in 2022. She obtained her certification from the Certified Peer Specialist Training Program at the Kiva Centers. A big part of being a peer support specialist or a peer mentor is for Destiny to be able to relate and share her personal experiences with others to provide hope and support. She prides herself in being caring, understanding, patient, as well as supportive, which is highly important in a role like this. So the way we're going to format this this evening, there'll be three different topics covered, and I'm going to give you a briefing on all those right now before I hand it over. Dr. Mary Lyons will open our program with a discussion on what typical developing behaviors are in young children. Kate Rose will be presenting the early signs of ADHD depression, and anxiety. And then Destiny O'Connell will be discussing resources available for children at Wayside Youth and Family Support Network and sharing her own experience as a child living with anxiety. As an added resource for parents and older children, she will be discussing her work as a peer support specialist at Wayside in Milford, helping teens and young adults. I'd like to hand it over to Dr. Mary Lyons to begin. Thank you, Bert. Um, and it's a pleasure for me to be here tonight with you guys. And um, as Bert said, I was going to start the program with just sort of talking about the uh, what are you know what normal behaviors are, um, and what you're going to see in your sort of one. I'm going to start at age one and go to about seven. Um, do we? Can I see the slides? Oh, there we go. All right. So. Um, I thought I would start with just sort of normal development behavior, um, and then at the end, I'm going to talk about what are some of the most common fears and anxieties that you see that we consider as typical. So at age one, we notice that kids really start becoming a little bit more aware of themselves and other people, right? So they'll notice more around them, they'll notice the people around them, and they start to you know, recognize themselves in the mirror. Um, you know, you see them a little bit under one, they're looking at their hands and they notice that they're like a little person, that kind of thing. They're starting to recognize that. They also start, you know, starting after age one to express their emotions more and they show some more intense feelings for parents and those around them. They're also starting to develop a little bit of independence, right, by one. So they you know, they want to do things like they want to feed themselves, they want to get their own toys, they want to play by themselves. And once they can walk, they start to wander off a little bit. Um, but they're still sort of checking out to make sure that you're there. And, you know, um, we'll talk about a little bit when we talk about their fears and anxieties about their separation anxiety, which is pretty typical at this age. Um, they're also uh, starting to play by themselves more as they become more independent. Um, they show pride at little, you know, accomplishments that they can do. Um, uh, and they really swing between this sort of 
wanting to be independent and want to start to do things by themselves, just starting, and then also being super clingy and want to be near you constantly. Next slide, next slide, please. Um, age two, they, you know, express even a wider range of emotions and feelings become really, really intense, hence the, te you know, the terrible twos. Um, they experience themselves as being, you know, becoming more powerful um, and having stronger feelings about stuff and wanting to, ex you know, to show that. Um, they're really starting to explore everything, right? They can walk, they have some language, um, they are starting, you know, will walk away from you even more. Um, and this is a time when safety comes into a huge um, part uh, to be cognizant of because you have to watch them because they're going to open cabinets and climb up on things and do that kind of thing as they explore. And they're testing their limits, right? They're going to push you to the edge, right? They're going to, you know, go right to that thing that you told them not to go to and put their finger on it and show you that they're, is that okay for me to do or not for me to do? And as much as they're looking for this independence and exploring and that kind of thing, they also really need somebody to tell them what is and isn't okay, right? So they wanna be able to do these things, but they also really kind of want you to make sure that they understand what's okay and what's not. Um, you know, it's, they start to do a little bit of self-evaluation even at this age, you know, uh, you know, they, You'll often hear once they get the language, you know, I'm a good boy or a good girl or a bad boy or a bad girl. Um, and they have these rapid mood shifts, sort of the, you know, the terrible twos, right? With their tantruming and things like that. And part of that is because they don't, they can't, you know, they don't have a ton of language yet. And so it's hard for them to express themselves and they get frustrated. Um, and so they will have a tantrum and they will bite and they'll hit and they'll scream and they'll kick and that's all normal right because they can't tell you really how they feel um and they just get frustrated um uh they're starting to be really more assertive like i said and they'll tell you no um and they just have a hard time self-regulating they you know once they kind of get over that edge or once they get to that frustration level they can't sort of bring themselves back um, and then at this point, they're still playing with friends. You know, they like to play. They don't really play with uh, other kids or people too much. They play next to them. Um, uh, uh, and that will develop as time goes on. Next slide, please. Um, by age three, right, the imaginations are really kicking in. Um, and they have a really hard time just distinguishing between fantasy and reality. Um, so they live in these little fantasy worlds. They have these, they start, you know, giving living qualities to inanimate objects. They have imaginary friends and that's all completely normal. Um, they are starting to learn cooperative behaviors, but uh, like things like sharing and taking turns and watching, they watch other children more and watch their behaviors and try to um, copy that a little bit. Um, and they really by three view themselves as the whole person. So, you know, they get that they have a body and they have a mind and they have feelings, right? And I think this is when it really starts to kind of kick in is at about three. Um, they're starting to become a little bit more empath empathetic and less selfish. When I say a little bit, I mean a little bit, right? Because there's not much difference between a two and a three-year-old. Um, but the three-year-olds are a little bit better with that. Um, but you can still see the tantrums at three and that's completely normal. Um, and they want, they really want independence at three, right? Because they have the physical capabilities of doing things. Um, but they, once again, you are still, you know, you're still in charge, right? So they can be overwhelmed if they have too many choices. So, you know, you want to say, do you want to wear this or this? Not open the closet and say, what do you want to wear? Because it's just going to completely overwhelm them. Next slide, please. Um, by four and five, the fantasy life is still very active. They really love to do a lot of pretend play, but they're starting to learn to distinguish between fantasy and reality, right? They're more friendly. They're more talkative. They're a little bit less um, afraid of other people. They are definitely becoming more sensitive to other people's feelings, and that's normal. And they start to be deaf. Now they have more language, right? So now you're going to get the more sassiness with their language, not just their physical um, testing. 
Um, and so you're going to hear, I hate you, you're terrible, why won't you let me do this? That's all normal. Um, you know, and they're just, they haven't learned sort of like, you know, they're, they're being more empathetic towards other people's, they're sensitive to other people's feelings, but they're still sort of like, you know, all about themselves a little bit. So they're just going to tell you right off how they feel. Um, and they're experimenting more with fake belief, right? So you, it's very common to see more, you know, some forms of even violence in their play, even if they haven't been exposed to any violence. So, you know, parents sometimes get upset that, you know, they won't give them a gun or they won't give them any form of violent play like that, but kids will pick up a stick and pretend it's a gun. And why do they do that? And that's just normal because it's all part of their make-believe and fantasy play and stuff like that. And next slide, please. By six and seven, they're incredibly independent. Right now they can dress themselves and pick their clothes and decide what they want to eat and all that kind of stuff. And they really have way much, much more language and you can have really pretty in-depth conversations with them. They think more about the future, what they're going to be when they grow up. They have, they they're, uh, want to be liked and accepted by their friends. They might feel, you know, worried about that because they, you know, the, they, somebody might've said something unkind to them or things like that, that really starts to affect them more at this age. Um, they pay, you know, way more attention to friendships and teamwork, and that really means a lot of a lot to them. And they just have better ways to describe their feelings. So, um, this is a great time to, you know, start to really talk to them about their feelings and how to uh, feel better, uh, you know, about life and friendship and things like that. They're able to just work with you on that. Next slide, please. So, I just want to talk. A, a little bit is my last thing about really what are the normal fears and anxieties by age, right? So zero to two is, you know, it's com you know, anything that overloads their senses, right? There, so loud noises, um, uh, anything that's like unexpected, those kind of things that can really, really make them incredibly anxious. Separation, and the first anxiety to come is stranger anxiety, which comes out about, you usually start to see it by about six months. So they see somebody they don't know and they're just really not having it. They don't want anything to do with them. Um, and then separation anxiety comes where they don't wanna be away from you. And 18 months is really a big peak of separation anxiety. So you have these lovely kids who sleep through the night and they're doing great. And then all of a sudden at 18 months, they start waking up because you're not there anymore and they don't know what to do. And they're looking for you. Uh, the other thing too is people in costumes. So right, a lot of zero to two year olds, like they do not like Santa Claus that big guy with that red suit it's pretty scary to them um by three to four same thing with loud noises but also anything that they feel like isn't in their control so lightning and thunder and things like that um it's pretty common um to get a, be afraid of that um any change in what they're used to so they're used to by three to four they're used to their routine and so if you veer off their routine that's going to be pretty anxiety provoking for them um, they start to, with the imaginative play, they start to get more afraid of things like monsters and scary noises and costumes and things like that. Um, and they still have that separation anxiety, right? They're still, they they want to go off and explore, but they also want to know that you're there. And if you're not there, they are a little bit concerned. They want to know where you are. And my last slide, please. Um, by five to six. Now they are still, there's still a separation component, right? They don't like to be separated from you. And sometimes it's because they know, they're starting to know now at five and six that bad things can happen to people. And they worry if you're not there or they don't know where you are, did something bad happen to you? They still have the fears of ghosts and monsters and witches. And that, you know, gives them, you know, then they start to have nightmares and they can remember their nightmares and that makes them um, afraid. This is a very common age, they're afraid of the dark. Um, and so, um, they'll come to you in the middle of the night because they woke up and it's dark in their room and, they, and they're afraid. Um, and then same thing like natural disaster kind of stuff, fire and thunder and stuff like that. Those are all really common fears. The by seven, the still the monsters and witches and the ghosts still scare them. Um, being home alone or being even in a room by themselves or a floor by themselves gets them kind of scared. They worry about their loved ones and something happening to them. And then, like I said, at this age, six, you know, six, seven, they really start to focus on their friendship. So being rejected really by friends or peers or things like that, they are afraid of that or they're worried about that. And then the whole natural disaster stuff as well is really common. So those are all common fears and anxieties um, that 
you may see in your children. And those are things that will just um, pass with time. Um, and they just need to feel supported and let and not um, uh, be not judged for those things. And you know, you just want to support them through it and let them know that you're there for them and and things are going to be okay. All right, I will pass it back to Bert. Great. Thank you, Dr. Lyons. Um, I'm happy to now hand it over to Kate Rose. Um, good evening, everyone. I am happy to be here talking about mental health and youth um, and just sort of talking about what we can do to support kids with our own mental health and learning how to manage their um, own regulation. So next slide, please. So some things that I want to talk about tonight are um, examples of challenging behavior, what it is that we're talking about when we say challenging behavior some common diagnoses that are found in children, um, and then just signs and symptoms of ADHD, depression, and anxiety. Next slide, please. All right, so the place that I always start is by having a conversation with parents, with caregivers, with anybody who's sort of in the home and in the child's life and talking about what is the rhythm of your child's life like. Um, you know, many times there are some of those challenging behaviors and we don't know why. We don't know, again, like Dr. Lyon said, what's normal, what's not normal. So my very first question when I meet with a family or do a consultation is what does the sleep pattern look like? What is their eating pattern like? And whether or not they are getting any physical activity and how often that is happening. Next slide, please. So children really need routines in order to build a sense of feeling safe. Um, consistency will strengthen their ability to self-regulate. So what does that mean? That means that they can manage the ups and downs. They can manage those anxieties, those worries, um, all of those normal things in a healthy way. And by having the consistency specifically around when, um, you know, they're sleeping when they're tired and they're eating when they're hungry and they know that they're going to have physical activity regularly, you know, every day, they're able to kind of manage those ups and downs in a much healthier way. When children don't have that consistency, and it's really unpredictable, that's when we see a lot of those behaviors. Um, so the best place to start is really looking at routines. Um, you know, I think it makes a lot of sense when we're talking about babies, and we're talking about infants, we talk about bedtime routines and all of that. But it's it's important to have that for young children, for tweens, for teens, for adults. All of that needs to happen in order to build um, your ability to self-regulate. So next slide, please. So this is just a quick chart just talking about sleep. Um, I really try to harp on sleep because I feel like it's the the one of those things that people tend to just kind of brush past and don't give it the importance that it really has. Um, most kids don't get enough sleep. Um, and even, you know, on top of that, they're not getting consistent sleep. So the amount of sleep is really important, but it's also important that they're going to bed at the same time and that they're waking up at the same time. So their body knows how to regulate, again, going to sleep when they're tired and then waking up um, around the same time so that they're getting that same cycle and it's consistent for them. Um, next slide, please. So when we talk about mental health, um, the reason it's so important to start the conversation with what are these, you know, rhythms in your child's life is because if you have a child who is sort of chronically tired, consistently hungry, and who just doesn't move their bodies, they don't develop those strategies for self-regulation at any age. And then that is when they turn to you as caregivers um, to do that self-regulation for them. So a lot of the challenging behaviors that we're going to talk about 
could be indicative of a mental health disorder, or it could just be that they don't have that consistency in their lives. And so when we have, you know, parents and caregivers asking for help and wanting to get counseling or medication or any of those sort of higher levels, the easiest place to start is with some of these routines. And I can promise you that if your child doesn't sleep and doesn't eat and doesn't get any physical activity, the best therapist in the world and the best medication in the world is not going to make any difference. So really being able to start with the consistency around what their schedule and their routine is. Next slide, please. So those are not the only three things that I, um, you know, want to point out and highlight. Um, a big one is what is their relationship with screens? You know, are they using them, overusing them? Are they using them as a way to self-regulate? Is that what they are doing for their free time? How long are they on screens for? And what is it that they are like afterwards? You know, if you are noticing that you give your child a tablet and then when it's time to take it away, they are having a meltdown, maybe that's not the best um, way for them to be passing their time. And maybe we need to look at when are they using it? How long are they using it? And what is the kind of before and after? Um, what are the dynamics in the home? Who else is there? What is their relationship like with siblings? Are there grandparents in the home, uncles, aunts, cousins? Who else is there? And what are the impact that those other people kind of play on the um, mood of the child? Uh, a sense of safety and security. That could mean literally their sense of safety and security. Um, or it could mean just, you know, do they know that when they're tired, they're going to be able to go to bed? Or do they know that when they're hungry, they're going to be able to get a snack? Do they have that security of being able to find an adult that they trust who's going to be able to help them with whatever they need, whether it's, you know, a big problem or trying to reach something on a high shelf for them? Um, and then what is their downtime? What is their relaxation? I think that this is something that I see a lot in young kids. They don't know how to transition from activities because they don't have any time to transition. They're very busy. They're kind of, you know, jumping from activity to activity and kind of in between. They're just, you know, using screen time to kind of pass the time. And so really being able to show them and model for them this is how you relax. This is something that will quiet your body down, whether it's doing some stretching before you go to bed, whether it's sitting and reading a book before you go to bed, listening to quiet music. Maybe it's not watching TV and jumping and wrestling and all of those things that, you know, kids really like to do before bed, but maybe modeling some of these things that will help them transition a little bit better. This is the best place for us to kind of start the conversation around mental health and really have a strong foundation to be able to teach other skills. Because if they don't have these basics down for their basic level of self-care, it's going to be really, really hard for us to go anyplace else. Um, next slide, please. All right, so what are we talking about when we talk about challenging behavior? I think it's a lot of different things. Um, for the purposes of this evening, we're going to talk about inattention and lack of concentration, um, easily distracted, uh, anxious symptoms, so crying kind of without um, cause, you know, this sort of chronic worrying and ruminating about things, um, psychosomatic complaints, so headaches, big ones, stomach aches, you know, kind of things hurting that, you know, shouldn't hurt, and we're not really sure what's going on. Um, aggression towards peers, towards others, towards you. Um, verbal outbursts, that could mean um, them sort of yelling and screaming, or it could just mean them, you know, not being able to kind of wait their turn and take that time. Avoidance of, you know, either schoolwork, if they're in preschool or elementary school, um, avoidance of expectations, maybe in the home, avoiding chores, avoiding helping, things like that. And then just that withdrawing or isolating, you know, kids who don't really want to play with their peers or who prefer to kind of do things on their own, 
like maybe you want to spend time in their room and not spend time with the family. Everybody needs a little bit of that, but if that's sort of their go-to or if that's something that's new, then that might be identified as kind of a challenging behavior. Next slide. This is not an all-inclusive list, but these are just some of the really common um, mental health disorders that we talk about when we're talking about early childhood. So neurological disorders such as autism spectrum and ADHD. We have defiance disorders. You know, I think that toddlers and young kids are pretty defiant um, most of the time, but I think, you know, when it kind of escalates to another level, that's something that, you know, we can talk about. Mood disorders, specifically depression anxiety disorders, trauma and PTSD, and then eating disturbances. Um, I have found that kind of post-COVID, there's a lot more of these kids who are presenting with this really restrictive eating or inflexible eating schedules or habits, and that is kind of a, um, an ongoing issue for challenging behavior. Um, next slide, please. One of the things that's really challenging when you're working with kids is that, you know, Young children obviously react very differently to life events than adults do or teens and tweens because all of their experiences that they are processing are normal to them. They don't have the um, ability to take perspective. They don't have any basis of comparison. And so whatever is happening is just how things are. Um, I think that's something that is that we sort of struggle with as parents because we don't know the whole story you know when we see a change in behavior that can be a really good indicator that something's going on but we don't know what it's like um my husband and I like to call them solo adventures when our kids go out on solo adventures they're going to daycare they're going to preschool they're going to you know a friend's house but we don't know what's happening there so I think that that's part of what we also have to kind of take into consideration it could be something really simple like you know a kid said something mean and now that's kind of you know they're ruminating about that or it could be you know maybe something else is going on why they're uncomfortable in a certain place and so trying to kind of um separate what is kind of a normal thing that we can do something about we can have a conversation about and then you know whether or not something more serious is going on with them next slide please all right so i'm going to talk kind of briefly about adhd um adhd is a neurological disorder that is typically seen in childhood um, it is uh, diagnosed by mental health disorder or through a neuropsych exam um, by a doctor, may present as an inability to pay attention, may present um, as difficulty with controlling impulses, or may be overly active. Um, all of these are part of what the symptoms are of ADHD, but they're also really symptoms of childhood. So, you know, kids have a hard time sitting and paying attention. They have a hard time controlling their impulses, their children, they haven't learned. Um, overly active, especially if they are sitting in a classroom for these long stretches of time, or if they're sitting for circle time, or if you're trying to sit and talk to them or lecture them or any of that stuff, they have a really hard time with that. And so trying to be mindful of the fact that sometimes a lot of this is just kind of diagnosed as being a kid. Next slide, please. Some other symptoms that will sound very familiar and kind of just like being a child, daydreaming, being forgetful, fidgeting, um, talking too much, talking out of turn, making some careless mistakes, um, taking unnecessary risks. I think you'll see that like on the playground, climbing up on things, climbing, trying to climb up on the counters at home. Um, and then at times struggling to relate to others. That is something where it's, you know, a, a kid who may have ADHD or some ADHD symptoms might be more rambunctious. And so other kids might shy away from them if they're really loud, because that can be a challenge for other kids as well. Next slide, please. <clears throat> All right, so I'm also gonna touch upon just depression and mood disorders in children. <clears throat> I think when we talk about depression, I think, you know, everybody kind of gets this image, a visual of being really sad, down, um, crying, and it's sort of this like kind of, you know, black cloud. And in children, a lot of times mood disorders and depression, that's not really what it looks like. It looks like irritability. It looks like crabbiness and that sort of, you know, um, 
hyper response to certain things, trying to avoid things, doing things with your family. If you're trying to involve them, trying to get them, you know, to participate in some way, sleep disturbances, sleeping too much um, or sleeping not enough or not sleeping through the night, a loss of interest, not wanting to participate in things that they once enjoyed. Maybe they really used to love doing t-ball and then you try and sign them up again and, and they don't want to do it. Does that mean that they're depressed? No. Could it mean that that's something? Yeah, maybe, but it could just be a child who's changing their mind about it, something that they once liked. Um, again, physical aches and pains that really don't have a strong, um, you know, medical reason, memory, concentration, or a persistent empty mood. Um, these are all symptoms of depression or mood disorders, but they are also symptoms of what it would look like if your child isn't sleeping well or if your child's not eating well. So again, to circle back to that consistency around the rhythm of your child's life, if they're not sleeping well, they're going to have all of these symptoms. Next slide, please. So circling back um, to consistency, Physical activity is a really great tool for self-regulation, and we don't always use it. So talking to the child, talking to the family, um, explaining about sleep, impacting concentration. I know it sounds very simple, but I think we don't always pay attention to it, you know. Um, trying to incorporate movement breaks, you know, if a kid is sitting for a long period of time, maybe watching something on TV, pause it, go take a walk, go stretch, you know, do something where they're moving their body around and they're paying attention to kind of noticing that they're fidgeting. Um, if your kids are doing homework, if you're trying to help them do homework and they're not concentrated, they're not concentrating and you're getting frustrated because they're not getting it. Take a break. Let them move their bodies around. Let them regulate in that way. There, They can stretch. It doesn't have to be, you know, you just stop and give up, but sometimes you just need to take a pause and like let them move around a little bit. Make sure kids have snacks. They're not getting hungry. I can't tell you how many times my youngest, who is four, will start to get really irritable. And I'm like, what's going on? When's the last time that you ate something? You know, you don't always notice it, especially when they are um, not necessarily capable of saying, you know what, I haven't had anything to eat in a little while. Um, verbal cues to sort of explain what it is that's going to happen. So they are aware of changes or they're aware of what's, you know, coming up for them. Hey, you know what, we're going to be leaving in about 20 minutes. So first, I need you to get your stuff together, and then we're going to get ready and leave. So making sure that you're explaining it in very simple language so that they know what to anticipate. Visual timers can be super helpful for children who have time blindness. Um, I don't know about you all, but my kids don't know anything about what, uh, you know, five minutes means if they're in the middle of doing something. So this is a visual timer. It's a big blue line and it gets smaller and smaller and a kid can look at it and they can see it getting smaller and it's a really helpful tool for people to be able to show the kid the time is running out. Um, next timer, or next timer, next slide, please. Okay, I'm going to touch upon anxiety disorders in children. Um, starting off by just saying anxiety is different than stress. Stress is typically related to something specific, something that is going on. You know, I think kids get stressed about tests or stressed about a dance recital or stressed about an upcoming trip. Um, that is not what anxiety is. Chronic stress can really increase mental health symptoms. I think that, you know, when children are sort of raised in this um, very stressful environment or they are constantly um, feeling the stress either from their parents or from the household, that can certainly make mental health symptoms much worse. Anxiety tends to be rooted in things that are unknown. So a disproportionate reaction um, to concrete fears around the future, worrying and fearing around what if, um, kind of having this negative self-talk, not smart enough, nobody likes me, I don't have any friends, kids who are sort of afraid to even try something um, because they're worried about what could happen if they do try that. 
Next slide, please. Um, anxiety kind of becomes this sort of twofold problem. Really young children notice differences between themselves and others, and then they become kind of anxious about that anxiety. Um, elementary school age kids, middle schoolers, anxiety can really look like um, avoidance, not wanting to engage in activities, not wanting to take go to school, school refusal, with a lot of um, roots in anxiety. Um, and sports, not wanting to participate in things that either they think that they are not good at or they feel like they won't be good at or things that they, um, you know, are just not finding that enjoyment in anymore. Um, I just want to mention, too, learning disabilities can really exacerbate um, anxious symptoms, and we don't see those. It's not something that, you know, that you can always know is going on. It might become clearer as they kind of go along in their school career. Um, but it's something that can certainly make things feel worse for anx for anxiety. Um, next slide, please. So what might anxiety look like? Um, you know, here are just some really simple, common scenarios that a child might have a really big reaction to. A parent being late for pickup. Um, another student who is tapping their feet or fidgeting or can't sit still during their um, work time. Um, a child with these really repetitive behaviors like hand washing or counting. Or a child who's isolating in their room when family friends are visiting. These are all sort of big reactions. Kids who are crying, who are inconsolable. Um, really identifying worries about, you know, things that you don't feel like they need to be worried about car accidents, um, you know, something happening. Um, so really just being able to look at the response and the scenario and seeing that, you know, why are they having such an extreme reaction and what is it that is really going on for that kid? Um, next slide, please. Um, so these are some really common kind of specific anxiety disorders that are found in um, in children. Um, it certainly doesn't cover all of them, but these are all kind of under that umbrella. Generalized anxiety, um, panic disorder uh, might be escalated in certain environments. Um, so kids who have these sort of panic attacks when they are in a really crowded space or when there are a lot of people around them. Or kind of the flip side when they're in, you know, you're outside and they're in this sort of open um, environment and they kind of have these panic um, attacks. Phobias, specific phobias, um, you know, kids sort of latch on to something really, really specific. Um, you know, I think we talked about the dark, but, you know, monsters, ghosts, switches, something like that. When it sort of balloons and escalates to um, them being unable to really function, that's when it becomes kind of a little bit more serious. Obsessive compulsive disorder, um, which is sort of under that umbrella of anxiety disorders, a lot of repetitive um, actions and intrusive thoughts. Separation anxiety, very common in younger kids um, and very common, again, sort of post-COVID looking at a lot of kids who were around their parents all the time. And then all of a sudden, you know, parents are going back to work and they're kind of excited to get back to their lives. Um, but these children who are normalized to being at home, being around their parents all the time, being able to access them as much as they possibly can, now need to be separated from them. And that is a very big sort of shift for them. And it doesn't feel normal. And it's a lot harder to do that separating. Social anxiety also has become a lot more pronounced as the pandemic. People not wanting to gather in a big group, you know, especially younger kids who are really just not used to being around that many people. It's really overwhelming. Um, and then again, eating disorders, eating disturbances, things really changing around um, restriction or being kind of inflexible around those. Next slide, please. I do just need to mention PTSD and trauma um, in children because it is a fairly, unfortunately, common um, uh, disorder that we see. Um, symptoms of trauma in children can look like avoiding certain people, certain places, certain things, um, being really edgy, hypervigilant, you know, uh, exaggerated startle response. Kids who are chronically tired, again, to go back to sleep, 
they might have a hard time falling asleep. They might be experiencing nightmares. They might be experiencing um, an inability to sleep through the night, um, irritable or frequent outbursts. Um, and then again, some more risk-taking behaviors. They may be more prone to isolate or have more intense social anxiety. Next slide, please. Um, and then just, you know, kind of mentioning again, COVID as a collective trauma, you know, and looking at specifically the impact that COVID had on parents' mental health. Um, I can promise you that if something has impacted the parent mental health, it has impacted the child's mental health. So as parents, as caregivers, paying attention to what is going on for you, because I promise that that is also impacting the children. So making sure that parents are aware of their own triggers and their own sort of relationship with stress and with um, anxiety, depression, trauma, all of that, and, and recognizing that that does have an impact on your children as well. Next slide, please. please. Um, looking at your children's behavior, this is the way that they are communicating, right? So they don't always have the ability to um, articulate what it is that's going on for them. So what is the function of what they are showing you with their behavior? So all behavior is reinforced or motivated by something. So that means what in the environment is sustaining or increasing or decreasing that behavior. The way that we intervene in a situation um, has an impact on how the child responds. So looking at differences in their behavior, what is it that they might need and what are they really not able to ask for? Next slide, please. Um, so I won't get into sort of the, the, I guess, science behind the different functions of behavior, but there are these four categories of um, behavior functions, attention, escape and avoidance, automatic, and then tangible gain. Um, a lot of times we'll see um, young children wanting either the attention um, to avoid doing a task or to um, get some type of tangible gain. And so looking at your response as a parent or caregiver and how that is um, impacting a child's behavior. Next slide, please. So what are they telling us with their behavior? How do we help to reflect on their behavior? When does the behavior happen? Um, when are they most engaged and what are we missing? Um, are the things that we are doing helping or are they making it worse? I think that a lot of times parents will try something and then it um, is actually having the kind of opposite effect that we're hoping it has. You know, they see that a lot of times with attention, if a kid does something that is kind of negative and gets this negative response from the parent, that's still attention. So a lot of times that that can actually make things worse when they're um, having some of these challenging behaviors. Next slide, please. So when we look at those behaviors, it gives us the ability to take a little bit of perspective, looking at an individual needs. Um, children can't articulate their feelings. Uh, we need to really look at what are, what is their behavior telling us? Um, you know, we could talk for a really long time about the function of behavior, but I think it's important to just kind of have that ability to um, step back and sort of zoom out of the immediacy of what's going on, you know, the tantrums or the, you know, withdrawing or the isolating or any of those behaviors that we've been talking about and trying to figure out are they trying to tell us something with those behaviors or is there something else that's happening for them? Trying to make changes that everybody can follow through with and can be consistent with. You're probably not the only person in your child's life. So trying to make sure people are on the same page. If you are, you know, if there's a grandparent who watches the child a few times a week, or if, you know, you're home some nights and then your partner's home some nights, trying to figure out if, if you guys are on the same page. Um, 
And then also just kind of keeping in mind that there's a lot of things that are very normal. Social situations can still be really stressful, especially for young kids. Next slide, please. So other ways to kind of manage that type of behavior, how to be supportive and how to kind of get that information from your child. Be neutral, be non-judgmental when you're talking about things. Watch your tone, you know. You might be frustrated, but they shouldn't know that you're frustrated. They should be able to just sort of know that you're interested and that you're curious and that you're asking the question and that you're giving them the space to kind of have those conversations. Pay attention to body language. Um, especially yours, you are probably taller than your child. So if you're standing over them and you're having a conversation, then that's going to feel differently than if you kind of kneel down and you're on their level and you can look them in the eye and you can have that conversation. It's going to be much less intimidating and they're probably going to react a little bit better. Noticing their environment. Are their siblings nearby? Do they not want to talk in front of their siblings? Um, is it really loud? Is this really the right place to be having that conversation? Try not to blame or shame them because they're just going to shut down and not want to share things. Um, being really respectful of personal space. So if they need space, especially if they're asking for space or they are showing you that they need space by walking away or going to their room, you don't need to follow them. You can give them a minute and help them sort of learn to self-regulate. If I'm overwhelmed, I need a minute and that's okay. And you don't have to have that conversation right then and there. Managing silences. Um, oh, and set boundaries, but choose them appropriately. Um, an appropriate boundary is, you know, we need to have this conversation, but you can go take a minute to self-regulate. Um, a not appropriate boundary is we're going to talk about this right now, whether you want to or not. Um, and then don't be afraid to ask, what is it that you need? Next slide, please. Just some more kind of um, do's and don'ts for how to be supportive. You know, don't make assumptions. Don't um, think that the child is, is manipulating you. Don't be punitive. Um, and again, be consistent. Take feedback and be consistent with all of the um, adults in this child's life. Next slide, please. And just a quick kind of visual on how to reframe behavior, um, how to change that sort of judgmental language to curio curiosity. Make sure you're getting enough information so you have a really good picture of what's going on for the kids. Um, and that will help you to determine what it is that you need to do for a next step. Next slide, please. All right, thank you. Great, thank you, Kate. Um, now that we've learned from Dr. Lyons and Kate what typical behaviors look like in children, the importance of sleep, adequate food intake and exercise or play, as well as several early childhood mental health disorders, I'd like to hand it over to Destiny to talk about some available resources in the community and her lived experience. Destiny? Thank you, Bert. Good uh, sorry, afternoon. Good evening, everyone. Um, just going to wait for the slideshow. Perfect. All right. So I will just start by saying that the peer role does vary within different programs and different agencies. So what Wayside does as a peer mentor might not completely line up with another organization. Um, next slide, please. So I just wanted to bring in some resources um, for younger children. This isn't up my alley. I do work with more uh, youth, but I did want to show what my organization does provide for those who are younger. Um, so we have some in-home therapy um, that is starts at age three and goes up till 21. Um, it is designed for youth with social, behavioral, or emotional needs, and they will work with a clinician, the youth, and the family they, all together as a team to develop a plan um, with clearly defined goals that may help prevent behavioral health crises in the future. Some of those services 
uh, provided include risk management, safety planning, skills training, and just connections to the community. Also have therapeutic mentoring that is for children ages four to 21. And that's where they can get more one-to-one -one strength based support services um, for the purposes of addressing daily living, um, social and communication needs. Um, it is a skill building intervention that is designed to help young people to be able to function age appropriately in the community. Um, and lastly, we also have outpatient services. Um, children can start receiving these services at the age of four. Um, and we provide either through clinic or virtual based therapy to support young people in developing the ability to better manage their mental health. Um, so this is in Wayside Milford. We do have uh, multiple different locations. I'm speaking more for Milford um, since that is the office I am out of. And next slide, please. So a little bit about my job as a peer mentor. Um, we are someone who has lived experience with a mental health diagnosis. Um, we use that to help inspire hope and change. Um, we have something called a comeback story. Um, we share pieces of what we've gone through to hopefully help those um, show that there is hope um, and they can get through it. Um, someone that listens and understands as well as validating their feelings. Um, we also help them set up goals and help them to accomplish them, um, guide them, support them, anything that they need. We don't do it for them. Um, we make sure that we guide them so they have the resources, but they are doing it on their own, even if that does mean having a little bit of help from us. Um, it's also someone that can advocate on your behalf. Um, we do hope that, you know, the youth can get to the point where they can advocate for themselves, but we will help to advocate with them. Um, and we also provide resources in the community. Um, next slide, please. What we are not is a therapist, um, hotline, doctor, psychiatrist, um, a friend. I know that is one where the lines can get blurred sometimes. Some youth think of us as a friend. However, we are not. We're more for a support system. Um, you don't necessarily need a degree for this job. Um, and we are not available 24-7. Um, and then just some things to point out. You know, we will help when we're meeting with people for things um, like transportation, but that doesn't mean, you know, we are an Uber. They can't call us up and say, hey, take me to this place. Um, so we like to just kind of put that out there as well. Um, next slide, please. So the requirements for having a peer mentor, um, you do need a DMH referral um, from the Department of Mental Health um, between the ages of 16 to 25. Um, if you're over 18 or older, you can apply on your own. And you do have to have a diagnosis or struggle with mental health. You don't need a diagnosis as long as you do have some type of struggle. Um, and you also, we ask that people, you know, put in the effort um, and want a peer mentor. That way we can start working together and get things done. And again, I just want to point out that this does vary by program and agency. Um, next slide, please. Um, so a little bit about what we do. Like I said, we do help um, set and accomplish goals. So those can include things such as applying for jobs, applying for colleges, anything like benefits, um, you know, SNAP. Um, finding an apartment or a place to live, shelter, respite, um, getting license, independent living skills, and learning to just build confidence within their own communities. Um, you know, everyone, we really meet them where they're at. Everyone has a different, you know, set of goals. What might work for one person doesn't necessarily work for another. So we do tailor it to what the youth needs and what they voice to us um, that they want to work on instead of us sitting there and making those goals for them. Next slide, please. Then a little bit more about what we do. We will text, call, and meet every week or every other week. Um, we'll provide support. 
We do attend meetings and trainings pertaining to mental health, just to keep up to date. Um, we'll research local resources to help our youth. Um, we do run weekly meetups, uh, which I will get into in another slide coming up. Um, we will collaborate with other providers and we are in the system, but not of the system. Um, so that just means that we work in the mental health system, but peer mentors are less clinical. We don't really identify with the clinical side of things. Um, so for example, uh, we try to use human experience language, person first language. There are just some terms that we try to avoid um, that may give the youth you know, may upset them a little bit just because it is more of a clinical term and that can be, you know, upsetting to some. Um, next slide, please. Um, so I did want to just get a little bit into the, uh, the differences between a therapeutic mentor versus a peer mentor. Um, there is a difference. Uh, so therapeutic mentors, um, they're also called youth support workers at Wayside. Um, for that, you do need a degree um, and you don't necessarily need lived mental health experience. Um, they do work with those under 21, so they do cover a little bit more of the younger side, whereas I don't. Um, they are a little bit more clinical, so they work on things such as like treatment plans and therapeutic goals, um, whereas peer mentor, we do work on goals, but it's a bit more laid back and it's not like we are following a treatment plan. Um, and for peer mentor or peer support specialists, like I said, you don't necessarily need a college degree. You do need a high school high school diploma at the very least. You do need um, lived mental health experience. Typically, they work with young adults. Um, it's very young adult driven. As I said, we try to get the input from the youth and what they really want and allow their voice to shine. Um, and again, we also advocate for young adults um, and help them to do that for themselves. Next slide, please. Um, for the interest of time, I won't get into every little detail, um, but these are uh, the young adult meetups that we run. So we do a theme night. Um, we run something called Zelting 101. We do intro to Adulting 101 at the Milford High School. Um, we have a monthly young adult game night and then an LGBTQ plus open discussion group. And if anyone does have any questions, um, wants to get a little bit more information on these meetups, um, please feel free to contact the email that's at the top, peer support at waysideyouth.org. Um, this is for 16 to 25, just to put out there, if you know of anyone, um, please feel free to reach out. And next slide, please. Um, so just a little bit more about what Wayside is. Um, we provide a variety of services at several different sites, as I mentioned. Um, and I will specifically speak to just Milford since this is where we are and where I am out of. Um, we have served the Milford community for more than 20 years. Um, and it became the Wayside Community Counseling Center in 1997. And today, Milford services include outpatient counseling, in-home therapy, as well as programs for victims of interpersonal violence as well. Um, we do have a trauma intervention services team, and they offer support to those who have experienced violence, abuse, and trauma. Um, we have experienced counselors to help with things such as domestic violence, sexual violence, um, those who may be impacted by deaths um, or homicide, and help children and families just process that healing. Um, and as mentioned, we do have outpatient counseling as well um, for a range of mental health services for children, adolescents, and families, um, and can include things such as diagnostic testing, evaluations, and medication. Um, as well as individual group and family therapy. And again, we have in-home therapy and family-based services that are provided to families um, who are in therapy, but just require that additional support. And next slide, please. All right, and then I just wanted to speak a little bit on the parent-peer partnership program. That is the program that I specifically work at. Um, so we do have 
family support specialists as well as the peer support specialists. Um, and we are all individuals with lived experience um, with mental health and we provide support and information and resources to young adults 16 to 25 or to parents who are raising a child with mental health concerns. Um, both roles help people to develop advocacy skills and identify and work towards goals. Um, Parent Peer Partnership Program offers meetups and one-on-one -one support for both parents and young adults. Um, even though self-disclosure can be limited um, in strictly therapeutic relationships and more of a lived experience role, it can be a vital part of the process um, for the young adult or family's recovery when it's used genuinely, strategically, and effectively. Um, and both peer support specialists and family support specialists are trained in how to use our personal experience. Um, so there are, you know, the kind of the do's and the don'ts of what to say um, and what not to say um, when sharing our personal experience and how to navigate that. So we do have, you know, specific trainings to help us figure out how to convey our own recovery in a way that can be helpful for others. Um, next slide, please. All right, I know this is wordy, so I will just kind of sum this up. Um, just to, again, peer support specialist is someone who has lived experience and who has been trained to support those with um, mental health struggles or any type of trauma. Um, and although, you know, we don't have professional training necessarily to get into the role, um that is something that you know you can't necessarily replicate when you're talking about your own personal experience um and providing hope to others um so some roles filled by peer support specialists include assisting their peers and just articulating goals for recovery you know monitoring progress and trying to model effective coping skills and self-help strategies um, and in 2007, the Department of Health and Human Services did recognize peer support services as an evidence-based practice, um, and it did also inform all 50 state Medicaid directors um, that they would pay for peer support services as well. Um, so it is being more widely recognized um, than it has been in the past. And then I will um, just quickly talk about my story um, and my own experience with uh, anxiety growing up as a child. Um, so this is my recovery story. Um, so growing up, I didn't have a care in the world. Everything in life always seemed peaceful and fun. That is until something had changed. It quite literally felt like someone flipped a switch in my brain. I went from always being happy, smiling, and laughing to confusion, crying, panic, and experiencing nausea just about every single day. I was 10 years old when things started to change for the worse. And prior to that age, I was very carefree, dancing, performing recitals in front of others, and I didn't think twice about it. However, a few months after I turned 10, I started to freeze when it came to the things I used to do naturally and without any challenges. At such a young age and never having really been exposed to anxiety and what that meant, what that looked like, or what that felt like really made me feel out of place. And although I wasn't consciously thinking about it at the time, I feel as though I thought what I was experiencing was quote unquote normal. I feel like I didn't even understand myself and what I was experiencing, never mind anyone else understanding for that matter. Going to school was my biggest challenge in life at the time. I started to experience intense and extreme fear when I was in school. And for me, this looked like uncontrollably crying, hyperventilating and feeling like I couldn't breathe, as well as feeling stuck frozen in my tracks, and something was preventing me from going over to the other side, literally. By going over to the other side, that meant me taking the steps to walk through the door and into the classroom. One of my biggest struggles was going into a classroom. 
There were many days I stood outside the door where all I could feel was the fear, my body shaking and tears streaming down my face. No one around me understood me and what I was going through at the time. At times, I felt like the school thought I was acting out or just flat out refusing to go to class when really I was dying on the inside. I was struggling with my feelings partly because I didn't understand it and partly because I felt like an outcast. It felt like I had no control over my feelings or myself whatsoever. In the most defining moment where I finally started to recognize that something needed to change was one that almost feels embarrassing to say because it seems so odd. After continuing to experience extreme fear in school, I decided to hide under a desk in the main office. And whether that was intentionally a cry for help or more of a response to my feelings of fear, I felt like that was the best option for me at that time. This prompted the school to send me to the emergency room for a psychiatric evaluation. Someone finally realized there was something more going on than me just refusing to go to class. And now this is where my memory gets a little fuzzy. After being in the hospital for the evaluation, the next thing I remember is being in therapy and starting medications to help ease my symptoms. And although this was my first introduction to recovery and one that did truly help me, there was so much more than just therapy and medication. I recognized the importance of breathing exercises in my life and found common peace in nature and being around others who supported me along the way. I had a mentor growing up, and although I don't believe it was a peer mentor, and if it was, I never really got that relatability or personal experience of it, which I really recognize is important. Once I found a job as a peer specialist about 10 years later, I recognize the importance of making connections with your peers and being there as a supporter. That is the one thing I can say I wish I had, because everything else was enough to get me to where I am today. For someone who never thought she would be able to manage her anxiety, I am living proof that it can happen, that you can do it, and my story is a prime example. Speaking out to others was once something I couldn't do. And although I do still experience some anxiety doing that, I can do it and I do it. And thank you for listening. I will turn it back to Bert. Thank you very much, Destiny. I appreciate that in your candor with your story about growing up with anxiety. Many people have it. Um, many people have depression and other disorders as well. So I think helping people understand that it is not abnormal. It is what we see in people every day and that we can help each other. And I think that what you just expressed was very true, whether it's through a peer support or just being supportive is key. Um, I know that we do have some resources to show that you can um, take a peek at. Um, Dr. Lyons and others provided us some great resources for all of you. And with those resources, um, we will be sending you all a link, an email link to this webinar in the coming days so you can listen again, share with your friends and neighbors, or just be able to look at these great resources so you don't have to write so feverishly down. And while they're up, we can if you would like, start the question and answer section. Um, we have several questions that have come through. And I think I'm going to start with you, Kate. What is the earliest a child might be diagnosed with depression? Um, it's a good question. Um, I, I guess I don't know that there's a hard and fast answer. I feel like I have seen kids um, typically, uh, I feel like the, I would say like eight to 10 age range. I feel like prior to that, it's, you know, there's a lot of um, 
I don't want to say guessing, but trying to kind of decide between some of those other symptoms, what's normal, what's abnormal, you know, trying to identify if there's a medical issue, um, if there is sleep disturbance, you know, kind of some of the other stuff that we had talked about prior to. Um, but I think that if we're looking at, you know, depression specifically, I think there'd be like skewing a little bit older. So I would say eight to 10 ish. Dr. Lyons, you want to weigh in? Yeah, I would agree with that. I think that um, of the three diagnoses, ADHD, anxiety, and depression, I think depression is a little bit, is going to be a little bit on the older end. Um, um, because uh, first of all, it's hard for them to articulate kind of the feelings of depression and you don't see as many of sort of the behaviors and symptoms as you do in the other two. Um, so I would agree with Kate. Great. And then staying with you, Dr. Lyons, how much crying is too much in my preschooler? <laughs> uh, that's a good question. So um, I think that, you know, I think it's not so much the amount of crying, right? Because your um, personalities are different in every person, right? And, the, you know, you can't control or um, you can't change personalities, right? So there are some people who are much, some children who are much more, uh, dramatic and empathetic and they may cry more. I think what you want to look for more is, you know, is there a reasonable reason why they're crying? Um, and so if they have a reasonable uh, trigger for what's making them cry, then that's okay, right? Um, you know, if you skin your knee or your best friend got hurt or your doll broke, you know, broke or things like that, that, you know, that, you know, some kids may not cry about that and that's okay that they don't cry, but other kids may cry and that's fine. So I think it's more, not so much a amount of crying as it is the, um, is it, you know, it, is it in response to what you would normally think that some, something that would make kids upset? Great. Thank you. And then both for you, both both of you, again, there is another question that just came in that aligns with the diagnosed with depression age. Um, what typical age would you see children being diagnosed with ADHD since it's different from depression? Yeah, so I think that um, my take anyways on ADHD, right, is that I try to say to parents, a lot of us have ADHD, right? But we don't always necessarily need to do anything about it. And we learn over time how to channel that energy and focus uh, and learn self-focus techniques and stuff like that. I think that the youngest that you'll be diagnosed with ADHD in general is at around six to seven. Um, uh, I have seen children younger than that, maybe even three to four be diagnosed with ADHD, but those are kids that have such poor impulse control that they're harming themselves. Um, and so I think really when you, the most of the diagnosis of ADHD are starting to brew at about age six to seven when they're in school and it's starting to affect their learning. Um, Kate, would you agree with that? Yeah. I mean, I think that a lot of the screening, um, you know, questionnaires and things like that ask teachers because that is when you're starting to see that kind of impact your learning ability. So I think school age is, um, when you start to see that. Great, thank you. And Kate, how, as parents, can we encourage our children to be more resilient? Um, so resilience, I think, is a really big um, topic that we try and bring into uh, therapy and we try to bring into just, you know, I think the classroom, I think, you know, classes and preschools are doing a really great job talking about resilience. Um, I think that children need to feel pride and they need to do things that they are um, excited about. I think we as parents need to show interest in what our kids are talking about and showing us. And we need to validate that, you know, what they are doing is important and it matters. And I think that the more that we can do that and support them and their interests, um, the more confident that they become. And then, you know, that builds their resilience and their ability to kind of manage those ups and downs that are, again, very normal um, and give them that ability to recognize, oh, okay, I can do this. I don't need someone else to regulate this for me. So. Great. Thank you. Um, Destiny, how can a peer mentor be beneficial if my child is already receiving a variety of different services? 
That is a good question. I've actually had people ask me that before. Um, and what I always say is it's really the lived experience aspect of it that brings in a different factor. You know, I've had youth tell me that they have a bunch of different providers. They really enjoy working with them. Um, but just to get that relatability, you know, we tend to be around the age range um, of the youth that we are working with. So it is a lot easier for them to be able to relate to us um, what we have gone through. Um, so I, I really say that and also the fact that we are less clinical. And I only say this because just within my work, I've noticed that, you know, the clinical aspect does scare some of the youth. Um, and to bring that piece where it almost feels a little bit more laid back um, and not as much pressure. And this is just based off of what I've heard from youth. Um, I think that that is really where it can get beneficial and they start to open up once you allow them and give them that time to feel comfortable as well versus getting right in and getting to goals and having to follow that treatment plan that can become scary for some people. Good point. Staying with you, Destiny, and you talked about being the peer mentor, but you also talked about your personal experience. And how does one know, how does a parent know that you as the peer mentor, and I think about this with recovery coaches too, how do they know that you're in the right place to help support their child? I think part of that is definitely during the hiring process. I know, you know, they definitely make sure that when you're getting hired, you are in the right state of mind. Specifically, when I got hired here, it was along the lines of, you know, I think it was a requirement to not be hospitalized within the last year, um, just for starters. And of course, you know, they will kind of figure out where you're at. Um, but I really think that for me, just coming into this role and just knowing that I was ready, I feel a lot of people um, getting into this role most times feel like they're in a spot where they can give back um, because that is also scary to be able to, you know, talk about your own experiences. And part of it, I think, is just feeling ready within yourself as well and knowing that you are at that point where you can give back. And of course, we all still have our struggles. And that is one misconception, you know, that I think peer mentors get a lot is, you know, we can't have a bad day sometimes because it's looked at as, you know, oh, well, we're not doing so well mentally anymore. How are we supposed to support others? And, you know, I think it's good to point out that we do still have bad days and we have developed skills to be able to get through that in a positive way. And I think that to your point, I think that's something that you can relate to those that are having the same issue of a bad day. Well, and I like that because you can be very personal. Well, I had that same type of bad day. Here's what I used as tools to get me out of that bad day. I mean, because we all have slumps, but to your point, if you have anxiety disorder or depression or something else that you need a little bit more, a little bit set, different set of tools in your toolbox, I think you're right. Those things that you can provide will be very helpful. So thank you for that answer. Um, Dr. Lyons. My toddler has not seen my dad in a while. In that time, he grew a beard. I've seen this happen because I've grown a beard with my nieces and nephews. And the first niece that the little one saw me, she almost panicked. When he saw him, he was afraid of him. Same same re reaction I got from her. Is this normal behavior? Yeah, completely, right? So that's that we talked about with sort of changes in routine and, and strangers, right? So they may not have recognized your father. Um, because of the beard, he looks different. And so that was just a new person to them. And they were just afraid of that. And once they figured out that once they figure out that it's really their papa or grampy, then that, you know, that should pass. Um, but that initial reaction of being frightened is normal. Great. Thank you. And Kate, I love the fact that the first thing you started out with was nutrition. 
and making sure that they're eating appropriately, they have exercise, and all those pieces that go together and a good amount of sleep. Um, as you know, there's the new school food program that's occurred in the state of, in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. Have, do you feel, just and this is only your opinion, that this may help eliminate some of those factors of food insecurity that we've been seeing that contribute to some of this depression and anxiety? Yeah, I mean, I think anything that is predictable and consistent that a child can rely on that they don't have one less thing to worry about is going to be helpful. You know, I think that they have before school, they have a lot of breakfast programs. So, you know, kids can come in and have something in the morning before they have to sit for the next six hours. Um, I think that's huge. And I think, you know, especially when we look at kids who are, you know, middle school, high school, a lot of them are just getting up and going to school and they're not eating anything. And mm -hmm. then they're getting headaches and they're going to the nurse and they have all of these things kind of going on. And I think sometimes it's as simple as like, did you drink any water today? Did you eat anything? <laughs> You know, exactly. Can we just, you know, take care of these very basic things before we you know, look at what might, what the bigger issue might be? So we go back to Maslow's hierarchy of needs. We need to fulfill our basic needs first before we can worry about everything else. Yes, basic standards of care. Yep. Um, Destiny, do you ever work with children younger than sixteen? And if you don't, does Wayside? Because um, the individual that put the question said, as an elementary educator, I see how powerful the lived experience can impact a child's perspective. So the program that I specifically work for is only 16 to 25. Um, I do know that there are other programs out there that do work with younger um, children. Um, there's things such as like IHBTC, um, we have one of those at the Wayside in Milford. There's a flex team. I know one of the peers um, from that team has said they've worked with someone as young as nine, I believe. So there are definitely um, programs out there that service um, younger children uh, with kind of the peer mentor services. Great. And if... Um... Michelle, maybe what we can do is add a couple of those points that Destiny had to our uh, reference resource slide so that way people will have those if you would yeah, be so kind. Yes. Um, and our last question before we end, I'm going to return it to Dr. Lyons. Um, the question is, my child is a young teen and I'm noticing signs of anxiety and ADHD. Is it too late for a diagnosis in chat with the physician? Yeah, it's never too late for sure. And, you know, you do want to start with your PCP. Um, sometimes some pediatricians are comfortable making, uh, you know, making those diagnoses in even young teens still. I think it depends on the age, right? I think once you really need the input from both parents and teachers um, in order to kind of help us figure that out. Um, so I will say it is, I think most pediatricians are, it's, it's hard for us once they go off to college. We really have a hard time making that diagnosis because we can't get that input. But young teens, absolutely. And you should start with your pediatrician. There's all these um, different forms we often have in our office, have parents and teachers fill out Vanderbilt forms, which help us figure that kind of thing out. And so I would start with your pediatrician. Not, I will say that not every pediatrician is comfortable with that, the older the kids get, but they should be able to direct you to somebody who can help you if they can't. Great. Thank you, Dr. Lyons. Um, please take a moment to thank our wonderful panelists for joining us and sharing their thoughts on such an important topic this evening. Dr. Lyons, Kate, and Destiny, I really appreciate you sharing all your valuable knowledge and Destiny for sharing your personal lived experience. We always learn more when we can put a face on some of the work that we're talking about. So thank you, all three of you, very much. On behalf of Milford Regional Medical Center, I'd also like to thank my colleagues in the public relations and marketing team. They did a phenomenal job working with all of us. And because of the work that they do with me, they make my role as the moderator very easy. Um, and on that note, I'd love to wish you all a wonderful evening and a safe and pleasant holiday. Thank you for joining us.